made the world's best chocolate. And you know, my background is an information technologist, and uh, I'm accustomed to uh, fixing things that are broken all the time. So one of the things that we did when we first started doing a lot of our research is we bought probably well over 350 chocolate bars okay, from around the world. Because what we wanted to do over the course of six months was to try every single one of those chocolate bars. Okay? And the reason we did that is because we wanted to understand what was the industry standard when it came to chocolate. And what we found was that 99% of all chocolate smell the same and almost tasted the same, as long as you stayed sort of within the same percentage, right? Well, the being the bar movement really started maybe about 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, where there was probably about two or three being the bar makers in the United States, okay? Today, just in the United States alone, that I believe there's over 200 because everybody wants to get into the chocolate making business, right? But we believe we're a little bit unique because we're vertically integrated. And what that means is when others have to go out and source beans, we grow it ourselves. So what we found by growing it ourselves is that the ability to control the quality is critical when it comes to harvesting, fermenting, and drying the beans. Quite frankly, if you don't ferment the beans properly, you will always have a bitter chocolate. So when you're working with chocolate and it has a bitter taste to it, which I believe about 90% of the chocolate in the world have a bitter taste because most of it is not processed properly, okay? But here at Spangola, we master what is called, when we harvest, we skim our beans to ensure the quality of the pulp before we send it to fermentation. The beans that don't make that quality are sold in country, okay? So when we first started, about 30% of our beans were sold in country. As we perfected our process, now less than 2% of the beans are sold in country, and about 98% of those beans make its way here, right? And that's how critical it is when it comes to uh, selecting the proper pulp and then subsequently fermenting. So let's talk just a little bit about um, the cocoa growing region, okay? So if you look at the map up here, we'll see that um, the center of the earth, which is called the equator, cocoa only grows 20 degrees north and south of the equator. Right smack in the middle of this is called the cocoa belt. Okay? And the cocoa belt is where, in these regions, where cocoa can grow and thrive. We can grow a cocoa tree here, as you probably saw one upstairs. You have a rock right by the window, it's about this tall. It'll grow, but it's not going to bear fruit. Okay? Now, the largest cocoa producers in the world are in West Africa, which produces about 70% to 75% of the world supply. So the first country, number one, is Ivy Coast, number two is Ghana, number three is Indonesia, and number four is Nigeria. Okay? Now, Cocoa originated, all the genetics originated from Southern Mexico, Central America, and South America. That's where the original genetics originated. Now, through the Portuguese and the Spanish, uh, what ended up happening through the trade routes, when they were moving merchandise, trading fruits, trading spices, they were also trading cocoa trees, okay? And what ended up happening was Brazil was the number one largest producer in the world, okay? That's when they were dominated and controlled by the Portuguese, okay? After the revolution, they kicked the Portuguese out. The Portuguese needed to find some other place to grow cocoa because the appetite in Europe and in Spain was really large, okay? So they didn't want to lose their grip on that trade. So what they did was they started to navigate the Caribbean and they started to cultivate cocoa in the Caribbean. But as you know, the Caribbean islands are nowhere near in terms of mass in compared to Brazil, right? So what they did was they took um, uh, seed beans and trees to a small island off the west coast of Africa that's called Sao Tome, okay? 
Sao Tome was the first island off the coast of West Africa that cocoa was introduced to. From there, it then went into Nigeria, worked its way through Ghana, and then obviously Ivory Coast. Okay? So let's talk about why West Africa is the largest cocoa producer. First and foremost, a lot of the trade originated with forced labor and slavery. That's how West Africa today has become such a large producer of cocoa. Because, you know, you know, back in the colonial days, they took advantage of that, right? So that's the reason why. But cocoa, as I just explained, was never a, a crop, an original crop for West Africa, right? Now, our uh, farm, as you notice in the video, it's from the Dominican Republic. Okay. Have you ever been to the Dominican Republic before, anybody? No one's been to Punta Cana? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So in the Dominican Republic, when you land in the Dominican Republic, the capital is called Santo Domingo. If you travel uh, west, you're going, uh, yeah, if you travel west, you're going towards Haiti. If you travel east, you're going towards Punta Cana. Okay, so as you travel east, um, there's a, a, a town or a, uh, province is called Atomayor. And Atomayor is where we have our farm. It's sitting on a beautiful mountain. It's 450 acres and we grow tons of fruits as I explained upstairs. Now, the Dominican Republic is extremely unique when it comes to cocoa. First and foremost, it produces 70% of the world supply of organic cocoa beans. Okay? The other um, advantage that the Dominican Republic have that they're finding is that the Dominican Republic has what we call a huge diversity of cocoa genetics. So, prior to about 15 years ago, um, the cocoa community thought that there were really only three types of cocoa. The first one is called criollo. The second one is called forestero. And then the third one, was believed to have been a hybrid between the two is called Trinitario. And the Trinitario was originated from the island of Trinidad, hence the name Trinitario, okay? But about eight years ago, Mars and scientists around the world worked together to break what we call the cocoa genome. Understanding the original trees that existed from the original origins and try to find, go deep into the jungles, and try to find the original genetics of cocoa. From that, they found approximately 12 genetic strains, okay? And we'll talk about that in a little while. So, that's sort of the advantage of the Dominican Republic, because as some of these um, uh, cocoa were moved around the Caribbean, the Dominican Republic is the second largest island behind Cuba, okay? So it received a lot of genetic strains. So when you have something that's called purity, it's called a genetic strain. When you have something that's called a mixture, it's called a genotype. And a genotype basically is, if you have 12 genetics, that genotype may only have four or five characteristics from, di from different genetics, okay? So those are called genotypes. Now, from our farm, as you saw upstairs, one of the first things we do when we harvest our pods we're actually inspecting the pulp itself, okay? And there's different degrees of ripeness because cocoa is a fruit. So similar to mango. You ever eaten a green mango? Raise your hand. Okay? You ever eaten a green mango with vinegar? Never? Try it next time. It's really delicious, okay? So when a mango tree, just like any fruit tree, is bearing fruit, it has different degrees of ripeness. And depending on when you pick it, is when it's gonna have the quality that you're looking for. Some people love green mangoes. Some people love mangoes that are just perfectly, perfectly ripe and they're mushy because that's what it has the most sugar, okay? So, in the cocoa industry, typically what farmers do, because farmers are underpaid, okay? When they harvest their cocoa, they try to harvest everything possibly off the tree. They're not gonna cherry pick it because every single time they have to go back and harvest it is an expense for them, okay? So the difference about Spangola, since we own our farm and, and we strive for 100% quality 
we make sure that we only harvest the pods that are perfectly ripe. Okay? Now, sometimes we get it right and sometimes we don't. So the goal is that when you cut it open and you inspect it, what you're looking for is a perfectly white pulp. Not a yellowish pulp and not a pulp that's too white. Because a too white pulp means that it's underripe, and a yellowish pulp means that it's overripe. So we want it right center in the middle. Okay? And that process we call skimming. Right? So once we skim our beans, the next step is the beans that are perfect, we're going to send it and we're going to ferment them. Okay? Our fermentation process. There's some question about the, um, checking the ripeness. Is there any way to check it before cutting it open? No. The only, th the only indicator to the question was, is there any way to check the ripeness of the pulp before you cut it open? And the, the answer is no. The only indicators are the color of the pods. Sometimes the pods start out green, and then when they're ripe, turn out to be either purple, either orange, or red. Sometimes they start out purple, and then they turn out red, right? So once you understand the tree, you'll understand how to harvest it, okay? 